from Hollywood. It's time now for Edmund O'Brien as... Johnny Dollar. Al Begney, Johnny. Grand East. Oh, yes, Al. What or whom did you ensure that you shouldn't have? What? Huh? Or are you inviting me to dinner? I get three kinds of phone calls. Social, business, and people who want money. Creditors or otherwise. And I don't owe you any money. I didn't mean to insult you. You haven't. What is it? You read about the cake burglary in New York, haven't you? Yeah, the papers say those jewels aren't insured. Uh, well, they are. By us. 125000 Do you want a job? Well, you don't need me. The police are working on it, aren't they? Yeah, but in the wrong direction. We think we've got a line on this stuff, Johnny, and we need somebody to go check on it. Are you free? Unemployed, yes, but not free. Where do we start? <laughs> Edmund O'Brien, in another adventure of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Home Office Grand East All Risk Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Adam Keg matter. Expense account item one, $34, transportation as instructed from Hartford to New York and the Parkview Manor, an apartment hotel on 59th. Your man begged me, met me in the lobby. Well, I tell you, I met her. Uh, you know what happened? Oh, you know, no. She was with one of those dancers. She was dancing. Hello, Johnny. Well, that's a fast trip. How are you, Fine. We'll go right up. I think the kegs are waiting for us. Uh, elevator's right over there. Say, uh, this keg, he has some money, hasn't he? Yeah. Yeah, he's the angel type. And so far, he's married at least one girl from the line from every show he's ever bagged. Oh, is that bad? I wouldn't know, Johnny. You'll find Adam Keg to be a very dislikable character, so hold your temper if you can, huh? Do you have any special reason for keeping it secret that you insured this missing jewelry? Well, it's more or less of a courtesy to Keg. He's lost some money this season, and, well, sometimes these thefts cause some speculation, you know. He'd just rather not be talked about that way. Going up, gentlemen. Mrs. Keg? Currently, yes. Oh, I'm Mr. Begney from the insurance company. This is uh, Mr. Dollar, our investigator. Oh. How do you do? Well, come on in. Thank you. Is your husband at home? Yeah, he's here. He's taking a nap. Sit down. I'll wake him up. Wake me up? Uh, these men want to talk to you, Eddie. If you'll take that corn off the phonograph, maybe we can talk. Sure. I, I didn't know what bothered you. Uh, which one of you is Begney? I am. This is Mr. Dollar, the investigator we hired. Are you one of these New York private detectives? I've heard the majority of you are willing to play both ends against the middle. I've heard that a lot of clients like it that way. What do you mean by that? Anything you want. Ah, gentlemen, please. Mr. Keg, I understand there was a message of some kind this morning. Who is this man? I'm from Hartford. There's not as much chance in a small city for two-end dealing, so I haven't had much practice. But I'm willing. Mr. Keg... Dollar here has worked for my company a number of times. We wouldn't have hired him if we didn't trust him. Now, uh, please, will you tell us about this message? Uh, go get the papers, Sylvia. It's right next to you. Right there, in the magazine rack. I didn't put it there. Uh, here it is. Uh, is anybody going to explain it? Uh, let me, Addie, if, if you don't feel like it. I don't. I'm bored with the whole thing. Paper was left in front of our door the same as usual this morning. But on the front page, this was stamped, page three, part two. I noticed it and told Addie to look at it. The bellboys deliver your paper? Yes, uh, Danny does. And here it is, see? This antihistamine ad. In histon. You see, the I and the N have been crossed out. And these other words, so it reads, histon stops that sign of your cold cash. Stamped in. Only his town makes this startling offer, insist on his town. Look at it. You can figure it. The rest of the message was drawn from the advertising copy the same way. The price of the product was changed from 98 cents to read $98,000, the price for the return of the jewels. 
The home of the firm, Montclair, New Jersey, was circled and rubber stamped beneath that were the words, phone booth, Maple and 7th, 10.30 p.m. tomorrow. What do you make of a dollar? Well, I'd like to talk to the bellboy. What'd you say his name was? Danny. Danny Stevens. Uh, I'll, I'll phone down and have him come up. That ad is the work of a crank. Anybody should be able to see that. You're right. You have to be a crank to be a thief. You think there's something to it? Well, demanding ransom for the stuff makes sense. If he gets it, it'll be a lot easier than trying to fence hot jewelry. Mm. He's using the name Histon and evidently wants to open negotiations tomorrow night in Montclair. You going to take him up on it, Al? Uh, Johnny, the company told me to do anything I wanted to. No questions asked. If you follow this up, you'll be making a fool of yourself. I don't want to have anything to do with it. I'm going to my room. Mm. He's a cooperative fellow, isn't he? He'll do. Do you want me to go to Montclair? Yeah. Yeah, I realize it's unusual, Johnny, but if there's a chance of saving the company the difference between ninety-eight and $125,000, I, I think I'd have take that chance. Now, maybe this uh, would be... Danny wondered if you could talk to him downstairs. He's the only one on duty. Sure, that'll be all right. Before we go, I wonder if you'd give me the details of the theft. It was a story like those you read in the papers every other week or so. She and her husband were out for the evening. Her jewelry was in a locked box in a locked drawer. When they came home, the dresser had been opened. Who might have known where the jewels were? She didn't know. Possibly the maid. When we got to the manager's office, we checked on the maid. She lived in Montclair, New Jersey, and she had just resigned. Then Danny Stevens, the bellboy, was shown in. You wanted to talk to me? Yeah. Have, uh... Have you ever been inside the keg apartment? Well, sure I have. I guess I've been in every room in the building. How many times have you been there? Oh, I don't know. How would I know anything like that? How well did you know her? Oh, Mrs. Keg, good enough to talk to. Had a cigarette with her once. Hey, you don't think I had anything to do with this, do you? You put the paper in front of the door every morning? Yeah, that's right. How about this morning? Well, when I got up there, the uh, paper was there already. I didn't think much about it because I figured maybe the night man had gone up there and left it. Had he? No. As soon as Mr. Keg called about what was in the paper, I asked, and Jim hadn't been up there at all. That's what he said, anyway. Where do you live? In Queens. Look, mister, the cops asked me all this stuff. I don't know anything about it. You're wasting your time. You'll be around here, won't you? Yeah, sure I will. I live here. I plan to make a career out of hotel work. I won't leave. Al Begney brought me up to date on police progress. The case was three days old, and all they had were some worthless, smudged fingerprints and the assumption that the same implement had been used to pry open the apartment door, the dresser, and the jewel box. They were canvassing the known fences so far without success. Expense account item two, $25, dinner, drinks, etc., after checking into the Hotel Langley. And expense account item three, $40 for car rental the next evening and the 15-mile trip to Montclair. The Maple and 7th, rubber-stamped into the contrived message, was an intersection that boasted three stores close to the night, and on the fourth corner, a bowling alley. The only visible phone booth was on the sidewalk near the entrance to the alleys. As I stepped inside, I noticed a pair of headlights snap on a few yards up the street, and a half minute later, the car pulled out and double-parked near me. Are you calling out or waiting? Waiting for a call. Why? Who from? Somebody named Histon. I'm your man. Come on. I came alone. You could cause me some trouble, but don't do it. You won't get the stuff back that way. That's a deal. I came to listen to you, not play hero. Yeah. Come on. Get in. Why'd he send you? Keg? He didn't send me. I'm an insurance investigator. I thought those things weren't insured. They are. That makes sense, I guess. Guys like Keg don't leave themselves open to get hurt. Always somebody else. You know him? I know what he is. I'll pull him this alley. Yeah. We can talk here for a few minutes. Now, uh, who's going to pay the money? The insurance company, if anybody does. How much do you expect me to sell? 
I don't know what you mean. I mean, what kind of a bargain do we make? Does a company in Keck tell the cops to drop it? I won't promise you that. You can't start something like this and have it all stop when you gouge $98,000 out of somebody. I'm not thinking so much about myself. Oh, you mean you pulled this heist for somebody else? No, I didn't pull it for anybody. It's a little too late to worry about whoever sold you information, isn't it? How close are they? Don't be stupid. Wouldn't take a junior G-man long to figure it. It had to be somebody who knew what Keg's wife had, where she kept it, and probably when they were going to be away from the apartment. Who do they think did that? I didn't ask them. I came here to find out how you want to handle this thing. I don't like it. I'll have to think about it. 98,000. How long do you have to think? Uh, where can I get you by phone? What's your name? My name's Dollar. I'm registered at the Hotel Langley in New York. Okay. I'll call you. I'll try and make it sometime tomorrow. That's all? Yeah. How about driving me back to 7th and Maple? I left my car there. <laughs> Take you there so you can follow me? Get out, you'll be better off with a little walk. He kept his lights off while he drove out of the alley, so there wasn't a chance to get the license number. But I had memorized his features and a V-shaped scar on his right cheek. It was 10.45 when I got back to my car. Not too late, I hoped, to call on Miss Millicent Weaver, the maid who had recently resigned her job at the Keggs Hotel. But I've been through all this with the police. I don't think it's right somebody can be pushed around and nagged like this. Do the police know you quit your job? It's none of their business. They'll be back to you when they find out. They'll want to know why you did. It was entirely personal with me. It didn't have anything to do with the trouble, except that when the police started to insult me, I realized how public my life was in a hotel of that type. Oh, that's not very good. It sounds like you quit to get away from their questions. That isn't so. I won't tell you why, but well, it has to do with my own personal code of ethics and, and how hard it was with that pack of linen closet wolves that hunted in that hotel. Do I make myself understood? Yeah, I think so. But you did know where Mrs. Keg kept her jewels. That's a crime. It's her fault. So busy impressing me with them. What do you know about a blonde man with a scar on his cheek like an upside-down V? Who? I didn't get his name. Curly blonde hair, nose that might have been broken. He's about my size. I don't remember anybody like that. Who is he? He lives here in Montclair. He says he has the jewelry. What does that have to do with me? Why'd you come here? I just wanted to meet you, Millie. If you run into a blonde man with a scar, let me know. I'm at the Langley. Ah, oh, good evening, sir. Key, please, 412. Yes, sir, right away. Oh, here's a message for you, Mr. Dollar. The lady said she'd be waiting for you in uh, booth one in the bar. Oh, it's a lady. That must be some mistake. Yes, sir. I, I know what you mean, but with this one, well, who cares? <clears throat> well. What do you know about it? Mm, I just got back from Montclair. What is it? Danny, the bellboy. They told me at our hotel. Danny's been killed. When? Tonight sometime. I'm not sure. But I'm afraid of what's going to happen. Let's get out of here. Can we go to your room? I've got to talk about it. We'll return you to the second act of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in just a moment. But first, hop along Cassidy will come riding up to the door at CBS, the star's address, again later this evening with another fascinating Western adventure. Hopalong Cassidy, starring William Boyd, is heard every Saturday evening on most of these same CBS stations, where you'll also find Gene Autry, Vaughn Monroe, Lucille Ball, The Gangbusters Stories, and Sing It Again. Now, with our star, Edmund O'Brien, we return you to the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Mrs. Keg was silent during the elevator trip up to my floor and until we were in my room and I had closed the door. Then she settled on the edge of the bed and started. <laughs> I couldn't tell if it was an act or not. <laughs> Come on, stop it. How much did you have to drink while you were waiting for me? I, I'm not drunk. Then let's use a little control, shall we? This sounds like a crying jab. Stop feeling sorry for yourself. Oh, I'm not. Look, if you're trying to make me feel sorry for you, drop it. Frightened dames don't touch me anymore until I find out what they're afraid of. Oh, shut up. I couldn't help it. 
I've been holding it in since I heard. Holding what in? I'm afraid of what my husband is going to make out of it. Out of Danny's death? Yeah. How was he killed? He was run down by a car. Going home from a movie. They haven't found the driver. You don't think it was an accident? I don't know. Danny was the first one questioned by the police after the robbery. I know they thought he knew more than he was telling. Do you think he was mixed up in it? Well, if he was... Yeah? If he was, my husband is going to accuse me of being in it with him. Stealing your own jewels? How does that work? Oh, they weren't mine. The privilege of wearing them was. That's the way it's been with all his wives. You lose the privilege when you're divorced. You were due for a divorce? Yeah. He got some ideas about Danny and me. It's funny, so did I. Well, there was nothing to it. He was a nice guy. Used to drop up once in a while. That isn't what he told me. What did he tell you? Maybe it isn't important. Danny did know where you kept your jewelry, didn't he? Yes. The dresser and which drawer? Yeah, I'm afraid he knew quite a lot about me. I didn't think he'd use it to do anything like that to me. How much are you holding back? Nothing. I came to you, didn't I? What about that hooked-up offer from Montclair? You know more about that than I do. You went over there. Yeah, I met a guy who decided to renege. He could have been a decoy or he could have been Danny's killer. Oh, I don't know anything about it. I hoped you'd believe me. That's why I came to you. I was going to ask why. What do you expect me to do? Nothing, I guess. I wanted to tell somebody that I knew what was going to happen, and you were handy. Adam is going to rant and curse and accuse me of every sin that exists. That's his marital privilege, I guess. Yeah. Well, it's late now. You better run along. The police played it cagey. If they did suspect that Danny Stevens' death was linked with the burglary... There was no mention of it in the papers the next morning. So after breakfast, I settled back to await developments. At ten, my phone rang. Johnny Dollar. Mr. Dollar? Yeah? One moment, please. I have a call from Hartford. Go ahead, please. Hello, Dollar. Al Beckney. Yeah. Adam Cake just phoned me. Oh? He's willing to drop the whole thing. What? Says he won't press a claim against the company. Oh, now, wait a minute, Al. Let's not plunge. What brought this about? I told you. He doesn't want any publicity. He says it's worth it to him to hush it up. You can't do it, Al. What do you mean, I can't do it? Well, it's up to you, naturally, but I'll tell you what it's liable to look like. Like like your company pulled its investigator off the case rather than uncover a murder. I didn't hear anything about a murder. Well, there's one rattling around in this mess. That bellboy we talked to. Huh? Well, I see what you mean. That wouldn't look too good, would it? I wouldn't think so. Yeah, well, you're right. You want me to call Cake back? No, I'll go right over. I'd like to toss it to him myself. I'll let you know how I come out. Oh, what do you want? I want to see your husband. You can't. He's, he's not here. Well, I'll wait for him then. Listen to me. He's here, but please don't tell him about last night. Please, you mustn't. We'll see. Come on. Announce me. All right. Come on. Sit down. I'll tell him. Thanks. Addie, uh, Mr. Dollar is here to see you. Who? The investigator. I thought I told that confounded company to leave me alone. The devil do you want? I'd like to know why all of a sudden you wanted this investigation dropped. I've been doing things the way I want to for quite a few years. I want it dropped. What's it to you or to your company? I assume you're being paid. They won't lose any money. Are you afraid of what, what might come to the surface if the police investigate Danny Stevens' killing? I don't want any more publicity on this thing. What would I be afraid of? I take it the publicity you don't want is the guess that... You might have faked this job to collect some money. You don't have the only slanderous mind in town. The busybodies enjoy playing with ideas like that, and I don't want it. Because it might occur to one of us that Danny knew the setup and was put out of the way. You idiot. That's an idea that would keep the nightclubs buzzing for months. You're accusing me of killing him. What I'd like are those same words in front of a witness. I'd sue you out of the country. I'm telling you that this thing can't be dropped because you don't like the taste of it anymore. All right, idiot. Go ahead. If you insist on returning my jewelry to me or playing, paying my claim in full, help yourself. What have you done so far? I met a man in Montclair. <laughs> <laughs> 
That was clever, since he said he'd meet you. What did you learn from him? Well, the only thing I can be sure of is that he's my size, has blonde hair, and a scar on his right cheek like an inverted V. I'd know him if I saw him again. Then go find him. Sylvia? Yes, Adam? Show this manhunter to the door. He's on the trail. Tally ho! I wish you'd drop it. Why can't you? What's the matter with you? Nothing. I just... Everything. I wish I'd never seen him or his filthy jewels. Why don't you open up? Oh, I don't know anything about it. Now, please go. Please, before he comes out again. Sure. There's nothing like expensive gifts to keep a woman happy, is there? So there I was in the middle of 59th Street with a basket full of suspects. An owner who didn't want to collect on his insurance or recover his stolen property. And an insurance company that wanted to drop the investigation but couldn't. I turned to the only possibly interested parties I could think of. The police. That's very interesting. Why didn't you tell us before you went to Montclair? Well, I'll be honest with you. Because I know it won't go beyond this office. We were willing to be a little unethical to save the company some money and... When we did, we were going to make a full report to you. Uh-huh. And now you want us to help you. I didn't ask that. I, I wanted to know what had happened on the hit-and-run death. Well, the driver's being indicted on a manslaughter charge. She gave herself up. She? She gave herself up? Who? Her name is Lindquist. She was driving home after a prolonged cocktail party. There's no connection with the keg thing? Not according to all her witnesses. Visiting here from Florida, got in day before yesterday. Huh. There goes that angle. <laughs> I'm sorry to disappoint you, but uh, accidents do happen. That's when I called the company and agreed that we should give up the case. I was in my hotel room packing when a knock on the door changed my mind again. I can't stand it any longer. i got to talk to you. You said that before. Come on. Well, what now? That man you met in Montclair, I know him. What makes you think so? Blonde, a scar on his cheek. I used to go with him before I married Adam. Who is he? Stanley Griffin. He's a musician. What did he tell you? Do you know where I can find him? Yeah, on 8th Street near the village. I've forgotten the number, but it's in the phone book. All right. He's been in your apartment? Too many times. I've had to call the hotel detective to keep him away. Ah. Griffin. Stanley A. Okay. I don't know why, but I'll go check it. Hey, how'd you get here? Because you're stupid. Close the door and shut that thing off. I uh, suppose this is it, as we jewel thieves say. Is the stuff here? Yeah. How'd you get it? Do you mind telling me? I don't see that it makes any difference. Keg's wife gave me your name. Sylvia? You lie. I have no reason to lie. I don't believe you. Why should she do that? I thought you could tell me. All right, I'll tell you. I'll make a statement, but not unless I can make it in front of Adam Keg. I'll leave that up to you. Where's the stuff? In the closet. Look at it. I moved to the closet door with him. I expected him to make a break, but he didn't. Instead, he opened a battered suitcase, fished out a paper sack that held over $100,000 worth of jewels, and we left. Well, what's this? Your stolen property. This is Stanley Griffin. He has a statement to make to you. Where's Sylvia? Mrs. Keg is in her room. I think she'd better come out. Why? She was going to share the profits. Dan. I think she should share the failure. Dan, you're lying. Why are you doing this? Tell him you're lying. How should I tell him that? Because you are. I had nothing to do with oh, it. Oh, stop it. Well, Sylvia. He's lying. Adam, don't listen to him. He's lying. Am I? You tell him, Sylvia. You make him believe that I'm lying. You can't do this! Come on. Hey, hey, quit it. Come on. Let go me. He's lying. He's lying. He's lying. Calm down. You're a rotten loser, Sylvia. You always have been. You're a beautiful winner, but you're a rotten loser. Adam, where are you going? I'm going to call the police. Adam! Sit down. You, you said you'd do it, didn't you? You said you'd drag me out of here. 
I thought you were just high, but you meant it. He's lying, Mr. Dollar. There's no way to prove it, but he's lying. You're right. Everything you've done to date says you're right. You're crazy. I'm not going to take the whole rap. Not for her. She told me where she kept the jewelry. She told me where they were going and how late they'd be out. Where did they go? Uh, they went to a lot of places. Now, you'll have to do better than that. She'll crack your story if you don't. She told me. I saw them go. But where, Stan? Where could she go so that she could leave all her jewels home for you to pick them up? That must have been part of your plan. Where? Kill him! Get away from me, Dollar. You've got it back. Leave me alone. Stay here. Don't try it. Get away from me! Get up. Why not? Keep him away from me. Yeah. Keep me away while you can, Sylvia. But don't ever forget it. I'll be back. To help the company complete its report on the keg matter, I enclose a portion of Stanley Griffin's statement to the police that same afternoon. I don't know why I did it. Yeah. Yeah, I do. I wanted to get her away from him. I loved her. When she wouldn't listen to me and leave him, she had me thrown out that night. I made up my mind to steal him and make it look like she helped me. So I did. Fixed up that newspaper I had. I was drunk and crazy. And I wanted to see her in prison. With me. Expense account item four, miscellaneous, $55. Item five, same as item one, transportation back to Hartford. Expense account total, $230.40. Remarks? The whole matter was no more than a cloud of smoke. The bellboy's death was inconvenient but accidental. And the burglary was a rare type committed not for profit but for revenge by a jilted man. The company could have saved the above total, but please remit. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, stars Edmund O'Brien in the title role and is written by Gil Dowd with music by Wilbur Hatch. Edmund O'Brien's latest picture is the Paramount Pictures production, Warpath. Featured in tonight's cast were Stacey Harris, Lamont Johnson, Jeanette Nolan, Jack Moyles, Hi Everback, Paula Victor, and Raymond Burr. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, is produced and directed by Jaime Dovalle. This is Dan Coverley inviting you to join us next week at this time when we will again bring you Edmund O'Brien as... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. How's for trying to sing it again tonight? $5,000 in cold, hard cash and $10,000 in fine prices are waiting for the CBS listener who can solve the new Phantom Voice mystery. Now stay tuned for Vaughn Monroe's Caravan, which follows immediately on most of these same CBS stations. This is CBS, where you laugh with Lucille Ball and my favorite husband on Saturday nights, the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs> <laughs>